Thank you so much, Mayor. I want to uh, thank Mayor Jordan for all that he has done to promote equality and justice in our city and in our state. We indeed are partners. And Mayor, as you know, I'm going to be retiring. And if you aren't going to run for mayor again, I just might run for mayor. You can be chancellor. <laughs> Phrase that you don't want it to change. <laughs> I appreciate being invited here today. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be with you, and I thank you for including me. I want to thank Patty Williams and DeAndre Jones for inviting me to be part of this year's Compassion Fayetteville program. And I also want to thank uh, Pastor Curtis Smith for providing us with a venue to talk about compassion as it coincides with. Black History Month. And I want to say how much I enjoyed that prayer, John L. Uh, you can pray for me anytime. So. <laughs> and Danielle, um, thank you for helping to organize this. Danielle is a senior member of our administration at the university and does a fantastic job. I did not know that you, yes, absolutely. I did not know that you're referred to as Sissy. <laughs> Somebody say that. So from now on, you're going to be Sissy. <laughs> I'll talk about you. It's always a privilege to um, share a podium with all of these people, and I want to thank you for inviting me to be with you today. Now, I should start by saying that I am no authority on black history, or any history, for that matter. <laughs> Insofar as we are the author of our own lives, I can address what I have seen and experienced as well as what I know of black history as it intersects with university history and perhaps my own life. By now, I hope it is well known that in 1948, the University of Arkansas became the first southern institution of higher education to desegregate without being forced to do so by court order. This happened, this happened when Silas Hunt enrolled in the School of Law and was soon followed by Jackie Shropshire, George Haley, C.C. Mercer, Wiley Branton, and George Howard, whom we now recognize, as you know, as the Six Pioneers. This was a watershed moment in the University of Arkansas's history. Its first attempt ladies and gentlemen, to be on the right side of history. I wish we could say the university truly embraced and encouraged these students, but when in fact, it merely allowed them entry at that time. Well documented is the fact that Silas Hunt had to study one-on-one -on -one in the basement of the law school, and that a rail was erected between black students and other students in the classroom until too many professors argued that that just wasn't right and they removed the rail. It was a struggle for black students to find a restroom, a place to live, or even a friendly white face. The years following Silas Hunt's admittance into the School of Law were extremely difficult for those who came next. Our Vice Chancellor for Diversity and Community at the University of Arkansas, Dr. Charles Robinson, documented their struggles in his book, which he co-edited with Dr. Lonnie Williams, Remembrances in Black, an Oral History of African American Experiences at the University of Arkansas. The book makes for extremely heartbreaking reading. As early students recount the obstacles they faced and the isolation that they felt. Melvin Eugene Dowell, the first black student born and raised in Fayetteville to attend the University of Arkansas, commented that he felt like, quote, a non-existent black spot, end quote. Billy Rose Whitfield Jacobs said, quote, we very strongly felt the university's lack of concern for our well-being and interest in our education, end quote. She added, quote, the lack of concern may have been more devastating than had we been openly harassed, 
end quote. Sharon Bernard, the first black woman to attend the School of Law in 1966, said that they were, quote, treated like lepers, end quote. Because so many of her contemporaries were forced to sit at the back of the bus, Sharon Bernard said that she always sat in the front of the classroom. Consequently, and unfortunately, there were always ten empty rows behind her. Now, while I will never be able to comprehend what they went through, I am able to contemplate excuse me, my place in a segregated society. I was born in Fayetteville in 1952. I know, I don't look that old. <laughs> my first exposure to black society came from a member of St. James Methodist Church. Her name was Nellie Dart. Some of you may remember Nellie Dart, Mrs. David Dart. And she worked as a domestic maid for our family for many, many years. In fact, my entire youth, all the way through college, included Nellie Dart. She came to our home three days a week and on special occasions. Nellie was a kind soul who cleaned, cooked, and essentially raised the four boys, my brothers and myself, in the Gerhardt family. When my mother had the fourth son, Nellie declared that if Miss Joanne, that's what she called my mom, if Miss Joanne had one more child, she would most assuredly quit. <laughs> my mother stopped having children. <laughs> Nellie was funny, she was clever, she was thoughtful, devoted, caring, proud, responsible, and loving. And we loved her very much. Nellie died in a fire at her home many, many years ago. She never had children of her own, but raised many nieces and nephews. I think about Nellie quite often, these many, many years later. One thing I remember is the time that I found her examining a photo on my dresser drawer that I had brought home from college of myself with Dr. Ralph David Abernathy, the civil rights leader. You see, he had spoken at my alma mater, Westminster College, and I had the opportunity to take a photograph with him. In my ignorance, I thought that Nellie might not know who he was. But Nellie knew. She told my mother how very proud she was of that photograph sitting on my dresser drawer. That was when I first realized that Nellie Dart had aspirations. She had awareness. She had political consciousness far beyond what she felt comfortable expressing in those times around the rest of us. And as I look back on Nellie's devoted service to my family, I realized that at its base, her service, one might even call it servitude, was actually quite wrong. Because I grew up in a segregated South, black people sat in the balconies of movie theaters in my lifetime. Black people did not use the city swimming pool. They sat in a segregated area in school. They lived in a segregated part of the city. They were not on the Razorback football team or cheerleaders or otherwise engaged in the social life of our students. Certainly, there were no black members of the Fayetteville Country Club. <laughs> They were denied professional and educational opportunities critical to advancement in our society. So while my family provided Nellie Dart with a living, we were complicit in an economic system that marginalized her and forced women like her to work menial jobs just to survive. Simply put, friends, we took advantage of her circumstances and her lack of options. Well, I still have great fondness for Nellie Dart. That feeling is now tempered by a sense of guilt that we perhaps exploited her situation. We were indeed a part of a bad system of segregation. I think the most repulsive part of those years is that most Arkansans lived under those rules and made little attempt to change society. I suspect that Perhaps they had a twinge in their hearts that it was indeed wrong, but it was just the way it was. And we lived the way it was for decades. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would describe it 
as, quote, the appalling silence of good people, end quote. The appalling silence of good people. Now, fortunately, things have changed in the decades since. At least most Americans now know that those years of segregation were wrong in every way. It has taken years to correct the worst of our society's offenses. It has taken years to apply the basic tenets of justice, fairness, and equality to all people regardless of race, religion, creed, and origin. Since my youth, we have seen advances in the enforcement of civil rights, the creation of opportunities, the ease of accessibility, and the spread of understanding, compassion, and inclusivity. The existence and purpose of Compassion Fayetteville are evidence of that right here before us. But like you, I am disappointed that we have not gotten further along in our lifetime. Less than two weeks ago, I read a column by Kaya Harrell, a student ambassador for Philander Smith College. Perhaps you read it as well. She attended a House committee of our legislature to discuss the proposal to divide the Robert E. Lee and Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. Now, I cannot possibly do justice to what Ms. Heron wrote, but I clearly can tell you a few things of how she felt about the issue. And I will read you her conclusion regarding this state of affairs, and I quote, Arkansas is still a Confederate state that institutionally supports racism by celebrating a holiday for non-Arkansans who advocated for slavery and secession from the United States on the same day federally proclaimed to honor the legacy of a civil rights leader, diametrically opposed to Lee's ideology and practices. The legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. has not been protected in Arkansas, and the struggle for equality, racial peace, and justice is nowhere near its conclusion, end quote. I believe it's impossible to completely disagree with Ms. Heron. The fact that these two share a holiday is not a good thing, and it's not right, in my opinion. And it represents a slight to the progress that's been made over the last many decades. As a university, though, I do feel that we have made great progress since the six pioneers were so coldly received. In fact, this spring, more than 700 alumni are expected to attend the Black Alumni Society reunion, which has become a major event on the campus of the University of Arkansas. Since 2008, diversity at the university has increased 80%, and we're very proud of that. A number of new programs, scholarships, and partnerships have been launched to serve underrepresented students, largely through the efforts of Dr. Robinson and others, including Sissy. <laughs> they include the Razorback Bridge Scholarships, the Summer ACT Academies, the Delta School College Completions Consortium. Excuse me. Consequently, we have a growing student body of more than 1,300 African-American students who are active in student government, fraternities and sororities, academic societies, and undergraduate and graduate research opportunities. They are campus leaders, they are deans, they are vice chancellors, department chairs, faculty, and coaches, and they are vital to our society in making critical contributions to its success and to its national reputation. We do, though, have some work to do in terms of diversifying our faculty and staff. Simply put, we would like the numbers to be much higher, but we're making real progress, and I believe we are getting there. Now, as you know, my work as chancellor of the university will conclude this summer, but I'm confident that the team that we have in place will continue to get results and be a beacon of hope. Related to the larger mission of compassion, I would like to add very briefly that we have lots of work to do as a nation. We're currently undergoing a debate about the rights of people who are different in their sexual orientation. It is a caustic debate, to say the least, and I don't want to impinge on anyone's religious beliefs. But I will say that I believe in a God of fairness, a God of equality, 
a God of goodness, and a God of inclusion. I simply cannot understand why anyone would want to discriminate against any person for any reason. Black be they black, be they white, be they red, yellow, purple, or blue, it doesn't really matter. Be they rich or poor, discrimination is wrong. Be they even a Republican or a Democrat. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe a mayor. I won't go fight. <laughs> this nation is also engaged in a raging debate about undocumented persons and illegal aliens. It is a complex issue, to say the least, and one that has few good solutions. I'm not going to venture out on that political limb this afternoon, except to say that I do believe passionately that it is wrong to keep a young person who came to this country as a child through no volition of their own from getting a college education. I have met hundreds, if not thousands, of these potential college students, and all they want, friends, is an education. As the greatest nation in the world, we should be able to allow them to get an education. I started with some quotes from Remembrances in Black, and I would like to end with a couple. Many of you will remember the author E. Lynn Harris, who passed away a few years ago, well before his time. E. Lynn attended the university in the 1970s and admitted to feelings of alienation and unhappiness during his time here in Fayetteville. Later, Elin did say, and I quote, I came back to the university in the fall of 2003 as a visiting professor. The whole experience has been so different and so rewarding. I feel a part of the community, and I feel a part of Fayetteville, end quote. I was very encouraged by Elin's words. One of the last of the original six pioneers, C.C. Mercer, who also passed away not long ago, he said one time, and I quote, I don't think the university is as good as they ought to be, but I don't think they are as bad as a whole lot of folks are claiming them to be. As usual, we could depend on C.C. for straight talk. And I couldn't agree more. I know that the university will keep trying to be as good as it ought to be. Finally, I want to say that I was too young to understand that behind Nellie Dark's good cheer and tireless efforts on my family's behalf, there was a lot of pain. There were unrealized dreams, limited opportunities, daily indignities, and the chronic fears and frustrations of being a second-class citizen. I know better now, and I hope as Chancellor I've helped the University of Arkansas become a little more welcoming, a little more inclusive, a little more compassionate in all the ways it was not for Silas Hunt and those who followed me. Martin Luther King said, quote, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward that goal of justice requires sacrifice, mm -hmm. suffering, and struggle. Mm -hmm. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals, end quote. So thank you so much for your dedication to creating a more just and compassionate world. I think that my dear friend, Nellie Dark, would be proud of you. Amen. Thank you. Amen.